Welcome to the lecture series of Public Theology, a cooperation of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology, the Bayersnau Day Center for Public Theology, and the Lutheran World Federation. The public in public theology, dimensions of a contested concept. This lecture is part of a lecture series on public theology in an international and intercontextual vein. Ladies and gentlemen, dear brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to be able to talk to you today. My name is Thorsten Mayreis. I'm a Christian theologian, a Protestant minister, and I teach systematic theology here at Berlin's Humboldt University. Additionally, I serve as the director of the Berlin Institute for Public Theology. Today, we're going to be talking about the public in public theology. Why do we address the question of the public anyway? Well, for Christians, it's not very hard to see. For instance, in the Gospels, it's evident that Jesus teaches and performs publicly. Look at Acts uh, at um, Luke 5 or um, at Matthew. Of course, the apostles, Peter, preaches publicly. Consider Acts uh, in the second chapter. And Jesus even commands us um, in Matthew 28 to teach and preach publicly. Uh, all the world, he even says. So the public seems to be something that is self-evident in Christian theology at least, but maybe also in other religions. But I think it's not quite that easy. What do we mean if we talk about the public? Our friends? Our community? Our neighbors? What if they are not Christian? Do we talk about the populace of big cities like Berlin or Lagos or Mumbai? And of course also we know that addressing the public is not that easy. It has to do with power. Who gets to teach and preach and talk publicly? And what is the public anyway? So we will be talking about the concept of the public today and in the end of this lecture, we will address the question why it might be sensible to have a branch or a discourse of theology that talks about public theology. I'm very happy to be talking to you. Enjoy the lesson. The first slide gives an overview of the structure of this lecture. As I'm well aware of issues of perspective and the need to provincialize Europe, so to speak, I'd like to start my reflection on the significance of the term the public in public theology with an example of public debate from my context. A debate in which problems of the global north and south collide and merge, and which mainly happened between 2019 and 2021. The main religious groups I will be referring to are, due to my context, Christian churches, in particular the Evangelical Church in Germany, that roughly represents a quarter of the German populace. Taking this example, I will then look at what I understand as dimensions of the phenomenon we call the public, and point to an inherent tension in the concept of the public. This will then lead me to the concept of the public proper, which I will suggest to define as a critical and regulative term, necessarily incorporating difference. In a fourth step, public theology is depicted as a discourse paradigm reacting to changes in the nature of the public over the last 50 years. And finally, I'll try to map some challenges for Christian churches. Now, on the first slide, you see a picture of a boat. Our voyage takes us to the Mediterranean Sea. 
It is one of the places where worlds and problems collide, resulting in people dying. Migrants fleeing from civil war, political persecution or economic need, but not eligible for legal ways of entry, try to make the passage from Africa to Europe in an attempt to survive and find a better life. Often their need is exploited by human traffickers that take all their money and leave them on rickety boats on the open sea. As the European Union has up to this point failed to agree on a common and plausible refugee and immigration policy, it has left the countries bordering on the Mediterranean to deal with refugees and other migrants. Rescue ships putting into port in European harbors are often turned away, as the shipwreck usually happens closer to the African as the European border, and maritime laws state that rescuers need to put into the port closest to the actual wrecking. But high death tolls remain an ongoing atrocity and moral scandal. Protestant bishop and Evangelical Church of Germany Council Chairman Heinrich Bedford-Strom has publicly declared, distress knows no nationality. And, as you can see on the next slide, a Christian initiative led by the Evangelical Church in Germany is teaming up with a number of other NGOs to equip an additional rescue ship under the hashtag we send a ship. This initiative has been noted in all of Europe and spurned a fervent public debate, especially in Germany. While some contend that this is a beacon of humanitarianism, you can see the placard on the right side of the slide, others see this initiative as condonement of human trafficking by the church. Some, but by no means all of the latter, come from a conservative or even nationalist point of view. In the public debate, a number of controversial normative issues are at stake, which can be seen in the next slide. They concern the understanding of the case itself, but in a wider perspective, also the image of religious groups, the state, and questions of the common good. A number of issues publicly debated in Germany are close to the case in question. Some may and should be solved by getting a clear grip on the facts, but most of them are normative in character. Is sending out rescue ships just an act of mercy and of help to the drowning? Or does it involuntarily help human trafficking gangs? Should it be understood as an act of mercy without political implications? Or as an act of protest against an inhumane European policy towards migrants? Are those making the trips refugees who seek asylum from inhumane circumstances? Or are they migrants contributing to the brain drain in their countries? In a wider perspective, even more general questions are concerned. Is the closing of borders an issue of legitimate national interest or just another sign of an unbearable global injustice dividing the rich and the poor? What kinds of agents are churches as religious groups anyway? Does religion entail morals and politics? And should churches get involved in political issues at all? Or would a withdrawal from the public square be a political statement all in itself? Is there a wall of separation between church and state? Or should there be? In this lecture, those questions just serve as an example of the issues that may be publicly debated in a given context. Here, the German one. I will not take those issues further. But to my mind, the Church's involvement in the rescue mission is first and foremost a symbolic act of mercy, the significance of which consists in saving lives, but also in publicly pointing to the ongoing scandal of people drowning in the Mediterranean, an issue that needs to be solved politically and the solution of which cannot be preempted by religious groups. This case, however, 
may serve as an example to clarify the notion of the public. What we've just considered are the underlying normative issues that are debated in the area of morals and politics. They pertain to what is just, what is merciful, and where does which category apply? What concerns the church or any religious group? And who gets to decide those matters? But, as the seventh slide shows, there's another dimension to the public, as the public usually doesn't simply mean everybody. Thus, there is the question of who takes notice of such a case. Many people in Germany will not have ever even noticed this issue, as they are not church members or not interested in politics. Others may not take the different aspects or dimensions of the issues into account, as they are in some way biased or simply too fatigued from work to care. They rely on tabloids, Twitter on, or other internet channels that report in often emotionalizing and spectacular ways to attract attention. A debate like this may mainly touch the circle of well-off and well-educated intellectuals who have access to German and EU-wide journals, some committed church members and activists. Many of those concerned, in this case migrants and refugees waiting in Tunisian or Moroccan seaports, may not even be aware of this debate, let alone take part in it. That brings us to the eighth slide, the aspect of power pertaining to what we call the public. As we've just seen, not everybody has the same cultural, social or simply financial resources to partake in such a debate. Not everybody will be able to make him or herself heard. While migrants and refugees may lack the means to make themselves heard, a large church may not. And if a well-known church leader, the bishop, like Heinrich Bedford-Strom, goes public with such an issue in a country where the statements of a large Christian community are appreciated, the media might react, because in a context like Germany, conflicts in a large Christian church still command public attention. But power is never just innocent, and the question who talks or may talk for whom isn't innocent either. Thus, a commitment like the one depicted, we send a ship, may be seen as advocacy for those in need, but it may also be seen as paternalism. But then, not doing anything might just be cold-hearted neglect. Going over to the ninth slide, if we take a step back from the concrete case in question, we can generalize a bit and thus get a grip on the concept of the public as it pertains to public theology in our example. Empirically, we need to notice that there is never only one public, but there are always many publics with different participants and varying rules and languages, so to speak. The articulation of what is seen as important or plausible is for that reason fragmented. Similar issues, how to deal with foreign people coming and seeking shelter, may be discussed quite differently in a pub in southern Bavaria, Germany, in the Parliament of Johannesburg, South Africa, in a chat room on Facebook, or a town square in Indonesia. As we produce the public by gathering virtually or in co-presence and communicating, we do so in divergent ways. The second aspect we need to be aware of, and this is the tenth slide, is that in the constitution of the public, or the different publics to be more precise, power is always an issue. The ideas discussed in the Indonesia town square usually are of less consequence as those debated in the South African parliament. Sometimes discussions are prohibited by force, or the practice of nonviolent communication is virtually unknown. In national or global perspective, big media or internet platform corporations or states, for that matter, 
may act as door wardens. On the internet, those who can employ web designers and technical experts to actively promote their content will have more resonance than those who can't. And of course, the normative issues mentioned above are not debated by angels who have no material interests whatsoever, but by human stakeholders fighting for economic, political or social success, for their purses, their power or their causes. A church that's set up as a large and wealthy organization may well have more impact than a poor one. A political party that's sponsored by billionaires may have more momentum than one that lacks such support. Even wealthy or powerful individuals may make a difference. Thus, empirically, the public, or better, the publics, are always spaces of conflict in which power is asymmetrically distributed when arguing about what may be seen as the common good. But even though there is not one public in which only the best argument counts, we talk about the public as a place of common deliberation. We do so in spite of the fact that there are always multiple publics and power to articulate and convince is even unevenly distributed. We do so in spite of the fact that the public is a fragmented space of articulation and a space of conflict characterized by uneven distribution of power. Talking about the public in that way does make good sense, however. First of all, talking about the public in, in the singular makes us aware of the fact that all those different publics have something in common. Namely, being a space where people communicate about what they think concerns all of them. Secondly, the singular transmits a normative criterion, stating that all those concerned by rules that govern our cooperation should have a say in the formation of those rules. Equal access and power in the deliberation of those rules. So, as the twelfth slide shows, the concept of the public is a concept that incorporates differences. There are many publics, leading publics and counter-publics. Many communicators are more powerful than others, but what we call the public is always about what is seen as common. And the normative idea of the public which does play an important part in public theology, delivers an important criterion to criticize fragmentation and power asymmetry and claims to universality by particular interests. And it does so to the benefit of those who are excluded or whose voice is marginalized in such discourses. With a philosopher, Immanuel Kant, we may call that concept of the public a regulative idea. It includes differences between a normative and a factual dimension, between plurality and singularity, between equality and inequality, but highlights the common denominator and gives rise to the critique of power and fragmentation. And it is the critique of power and fragmentation that informs theological, feminist and post-colonial critiques from different perspectives, reaching from Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer to Dorothee Zölle, from Jürgen Moltmann to Donna Haraway and Chakraborty Spivak to Walter Mignolo, Achille Mbembe or Tinjiko Maluleke. In a way, the criticism just mentioned turns Enlightenment critique against the blind spots of Enlightenment, and rightly so. The idea that people should participate in decisions on the rules that govern them is, of course, an old one. I depict that in slide 13. In ancient Israel and many other societies, the gate or village square was the place where meetings and judicial court sessions were held. In ancient China, the official courthouse was such a place. In Greece, the Agora, a central place in the city, was the place for public decision. In ancient Rome, it was the Forum. However, scope, 
range and eligibility of participation varied hugely. In ancient Athens, participation was limited to adult free male citizens, who made out one-fourth to one-fifth of the whole populace. So, democracy was pretty limited then. Additionally, professional speakers trained in rhetorics and manipulation techniques presented cases and issues to, to be decided. In the tradition I come from, the idea of general and universal participation is attributed to Enlightenment times. In the German-speaking world, Protestant ministers were important figures in the Enlightenment movement, taking um, the promise of the Gospel of John, the truth will set you free at face value. But of course, Enlightenment tradition had quite large blind spots. Women or non-Europeans usually weren't considered eligible. But the concept of universal access was eagerly grasped by many of those excluded and turned against Enlightenment theoretics, and again, rightly so. Thus, systematically, the concept of the public carries a tension between regulative idea, one public with universal access, and the empirical reality, which may then be criticized along those lines of the regulative idea. But, as slide 14 shows, since the global spreading of literacy, mass media and the internet, the public has changed. An expansion and intensification of publics has taken place. The term expansion signifies that so many more people than before can participate in all kinds of public displays and discourses globally, having access to ways of life far away. The concept of intensification aims at the fact that with the Internet, many more people than before are able to send as well as receive, and thus to produce publics of their own, albeit mediated by corporation or state-based platforms and providers. As depicted in slide 15, public theology as a paradigm of discourse reacts to the global expansion and the intensification of the public. Even though deeply contextual, it takes on the challenge presented by the fact that communication about the love of God or the meaning of a life devoted to serving one's neighbor isn't just regional anymore or limited to certain people who preach and others who listen, but that it becomes global and gives much more people the chance to participate actively. At the same time, public theology reacts to the fact that this type of expansion and intensification of the public brings about an increased pluralization in religion and worldviews. In societies up to this point predominantly Christian, like the United States of America, Muslims come to the fore and people with atheist or agnostic worldviews appear. In others, predominantly Confucian or atheist like China, Christianity spreads. In countries with diverse religious affiliations, the relations between corresponding groups become more dynamic. Looking at the public in public theology from a Christian perspective, three challenges appear to my mind. Firstly, and this is slide 16, all humans, regardless of gender, ethnicity, creed, are addressees of the love of the creating and redeeming God in Jesus Christ, and thus endowed with an inalienable human dignity. Consequently, everybody should have the right to participate in the communication on and ultimately the making of the rules that govern their lives. As we are called to be holy as God is holy, Christians should direct their efforts at the contribution to a public, and that means many publics, where everybody has the right and gets the opportunity to participate, unless 
this participation is directed at destroying the public. Secondly, that implies a self-critical perspective. As Christians know about the power of sin, that holds especially true in contexts like mine, where Christianity appeared as Christendom, was deeply involved in struggles for power and needs to face responsibility. As it became guilty of partaking in crimes like colonialism, racism, slavery, the discrimination of fellow humans on grounds of religion or gender, and even in the exploitation of Earth itself. By the way, my reflection on those topics and my position as a male and white Protestant Christian theologian from the global Northwest has been sparked through the contextualization debate of the late 1960s and 70s in the World Council of Churches by theologians like Shoki Ko and Justin Upcong. Together with other scholars, sociologists like Pierre Bourdieu, for example, they led me to think about a contextually aware theological formation in Germany, which I tried to explore in my dissertation thesis. But back to our issue. Thirdly, to my mind, the lesson taught to Western Christianity in its history pertaining to public theology runs something like this. And I refer back to Martin Luther and Reformed theologian Karl Barth here, albeit informed by philosophical and post-colonial critique. There are two ways Christian churches may stray from the right path in dealing with the public. One is what Barth called church in excess. As soon as Christians and their churches strive at hegemony in any given public, as they try to make way for their organization rather than look to the common good in politics, they are on the wrong track. As there is only one Lord Jesus Christ, and no human may take the Lord's position. That, however, does not mean that Christians should stay away from the public, hiding their witness. For that would be what Kalbat calls church in defect, defecting from the banner of the Lord. The type of public witness required, however, depends on the situation in which it is called for. In oppressive environments, such as the dictatorship of the white minority over the black and colored majority in South Africa, strong statements may be necessary. Thus, the Dutch Reformed Mission Church in South Africa drafted the Belha Confession in 1986, rejecting the, quote, separation of people on the grounds of race and color, unquote, as an obstruction of the ministry of reconciliation in Christ. Thus, the Confessing Church in 1934 drafted the Barman Declaration, rejecting the totalitarian state's claims in the oppressive situation of a dictatorship of a majority of Germans over a minority of other Germans. In more participative environments, even if they are less than perfect, like contemporary South Africa or contemporary Germany, churches may enter public debate as particular members of civil society among others, humbly giving witness and accepting criticism without demonizing it. That may take the form of condoning government measures, as the South African Council has done in its Christmas message of 2020, where Christians were reminded to wear masks, keep their distance and even refrain from mega-church celebrations. But it may also take the form of a more critical stance, as the Evangelical Church in Germany has done in entering the debates on the e European Union refugee policy and calling attention to the situation as an aftermath of European colonialism. To my mind, the Gospel's promise that the truth will set us free, uttered in John 8, 32, and Paul's dedication to candor lead Christians to a public theology that does not strive for political hegemony of Christians or any other form of oppression for that matter, but critically engages in public discourse for the common good, protesting situations where people are systematically and effectively excluded from such discourse, and it contributes to the production of a public where everybody has a say, regardless. 
In contributing to the public this way, churches may give witness to Christ and his teaching. Thanks for listening in. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Please consider also the discussion questions in the adjoining PDF document and the um, literature references. God bless you all.